Okay, so th thanks for having me here, Atif and Marcus. Uh, this is joint work with Marianne Bertrand. Uh, clicker. Is this a clicker? Yes, okay. So this paper, I'm just these borrowing two pictures that are not really needed here. We have two facts that this paper wants to offer an explanation to par partially understand. Rising income inequality we, over the last three decades is, is nothing new here and the decreasing savings rate that, that Chris showed us um, previously. So this paper is about are these trends being related through consumption? And basically the story here that, that, that we're going to, to go after is are rising incomes and consumption at the top positively related to non-rich household spending out of income? So I'm gonna use the word rich to mean income. So rich being high income and non-rich being low income, just to keep the terminology easier. So basically, we, what, we, what, are, what we're asking is, can we see a relationship that we can get towards some sort of causal explanation between consumption patterns at the top and consumption patterns in, in the middle? Um, and that's the story. So the structure of the talk is I'm gonna document that correlation that I just said, that there is a correlation between Consumption at the, the top and consumption uh, in, in the middle class or the beneath the top. And then we're going to go after explanations um, to try to pin down where this correlation comes from. And so we're going to go after permanent income, reverse causality, price effects, wealth effects through home equity, all these, these types of effects to eliminate arguments. And the... the we're going to come out with the, these stories cannot explain this correlation that we see. And then we're going to try to go after other mechanisms through the, the, the debt, de access to debt, access to credit that we, we've already been talking about here to understand how, how these consumption correlations could be related causally through consumption patterns. Okay, so that's the, 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 the gist of where I'm headed. And then we're going to speak to the magnitude Chris Carroll was we were lucky enough to draw Chris Carroll as the discussant before, and he hounded on us about speaking the magnitude through the savings rate, which we'll do at the end. All right. So um, this, the, the, the goal here is very microeconomic data. -y. We're, we're going to use a bunch of different data sets to address these questions and to, to put up this correlation and try to understand it. So the main fact, we're going to start with log total annual consumption in the CEX, 1980 to... Uh, to 2008, and we're gonna, what we're going to do is take the CPS figures at the state level for the income distribution, so that I'm going to define what the 80th percent income is in Alabama in 2002, and, I'm gonna, and for all the states and all the years, and I'm going to impose that down onto the CEX, such that the person who's rich in Alabama in 2002 looks very different from the person who's rich in New York City in 2000, or New York State, I should say, in 2002. So what we're going to use then is state year variation in these figures. Where we're going is within state year identification. So I've got then the CX. I've imposed a definition of rich based on the state year measures in the census data of what is rich in Alabama in that year. Um, and that is the, the, the main dependent variable are going to be the non-rich consumption. That's what we're interested in, in, in studying. And the main variables of interest are going to be income and consumption of the rich in, in the state year. So now we're going to have to deal with a bunch of different uh, issues in terms of, of measurement error and things like that in, in the CX. But let's just start with the basic definitions. The rich are the 80th percentile or higher in income in the state year. We're going to also look at the very rich, which is above 90. Um, we're going to measure these things as three-year averages to, to uh, have enough observation in the state year to identify it, th these numbers. Um, we're going to control, imagine then a, an estimation, which I'll put up in a second, but we're going to have the consumption of a, a non-rich person in the CX. We, on, and then on the other side, we're going to have the consumption of or income of a rich person in that state year. And now I'm going to absorb the income of the non-rich person. So I'm gonna, in particular, I'm going to use dummy variables for every $2,000 of income. So I'm fully absorbing income. And so I'm going to be looking at how consumption of this non-rich person relates to 
the, the, the income or consumption of the rich person in that state year, absorbing income, absorbing race, education, the standard stuff, with state and year fixed effects in. So I'm not identifying a, a state pattern, I'm not identifying a business cycle, um, and I'm going to put a trend in there, and so the standard stuff with weights and errors. Okay, so let me show you that estimation, and then, and I'm going to call this a correlation until we go after the stories. So here, let me just focus for, in the interest of time on the, the, the final uh, column here. So again, the dependent variable, log consumption of a non-rich CEX household. My, my, in this specification, now what I'm interested in are those first two, two variables, log income of the 80th percentile or log in, income of the 90th percentile um, in that state year, absorbing state near fixed effects, absorbing the household income in those $2,000 buckets, okay? So it's a fairly stringent estimation um, in terms of what, what I'm identifying off. I'm identifying off the panel in the state year. All right, so what we find here is that there is indeed a positive relation between the, the, the income of the rich and the consumption of the non-rich, okay? Our stories are gonna be about consumption to consumption, but but consumption has more problems in measurement, but I'll, I'll show you here in a second the consumption relation. Um, we, we flip, before we go after that, we flip this around and say, well, wait, you're, you're talking about income of the rich or consumption of the rich funneling to consumption of the non-rich. Well, maybe it goes the other way, that there's some reverse causality, the richer proprietors, that you could be having a tri trickle-up consumption, which is what this estimation is. Now I'm just looking at the households that are rich and seeing if the non-rich income or consumption relates to them, and I, I, I don't, we don't find that, that effect. Okay, so then the, um, the, the, the next thing is that we really are going to tell stories about consumption to consumption, and so rather than looking at the relationship between the income of the rich and consumption of the non-rich, we want to be doing consumption to consumption, but We've got problems with the, in terms of the data. Um, consumption of the rich is mismeasured in the CX rather poorly. Um, and there's also the issue of, of state year specific shocks, where it's imagine in your particular state, everybody wants to buy an iPad. And so you have some sort of state year specific stock, shock that's affecting everyone's consumption in the same way. So what we do is we instrument consumption of the rich with the income of the rich. Um, in, in the standard uh, approach in micro-macro. So here then is, is that estimation. Um, here is the first stage where we've got, we're instrumenting the, the consumption of the rich, which is what we're really interested in with the income of the rich. And then again, um, this correlation that I started out saying um, is, is, is strongly robust to, 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 to saying that it's, it's actually the consumption rather than the income. In fact, if I put them both in, it loads on consumption rather than income. Okay, so now we're, we're at the point in this paper, um, this is in the very rich, it's the same, same pattern. We're at the point in the paper, say, okay, we found this interesting correlation. We have a story in mind, but we're open to any, you know, it, this correlation could be a number of different things. And so we're not trying to construct tests to, to go after our story that we have in mind. Um, but instead we want to consider all possible stories that we could think of and all possible stories that we've ever gotten feedback on. Um, and so the first obvious stories are permanent income type stories and we're gonna do a precautionary savings type story. Um, does the, the income of the non-rich grow faster in markets where the rich are getting richer? Right, just basic, basic um, maybe there's a time lag effect on, on these things. And so to do this we can't use the CX because it's a cross section for the most part, um, and so we go to the PSID and we ask does current income, rich income, predict higher future non-rich income? We can control in the, the PSID for the, your own, the person's own in income. So let me show you that estimation. So now we have, um, here the, the dependent variable is the income, and again we're looking at the non-rich people. We're looking at their income in T plus one, we're, we're going to absorb their income in, in, in uh, T, right? We have their income presently. And then we want to see whether that loads on income of the rich, which it does not. 
Um, you, what we're interested in is whether there's anything on the second on the second row, whether you see any asterisks, and we and we and we basically don't. We do a bunch of other specifications for running, looking for this, but there's just nothing. There's 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 no relation between the income of the rich in a state year and the future income of the non-rich. Um, a, a related question is about expectations. If I see the rich getting richer. Maybe, maybe I have false expectations about that I will get richer as a non-rich person. Um, so to, to go after this, we get the micro data from the, the Michigan Survey of Consumers, and we get the state level data, on, uh, the state level identifiers, and we do the same exercise where we overlay this, the CPS figures about the income distribution, and we look at um, the variables. Do you expect real income to go up in the next year? And do you expect, what's the expected percentage change in your family income in the next year? And again, we can c control for your own income. So again, the same structure of these, these tests. Um, we look at the, the, the dependent variable, expect real income to go in for the next year is an is a indicator. And when, does it load on the 80th percentile of the rich income? And basically not. And again, we can control for the household income, your present income. OK, so we find no evidence that the, there's these um, non-realistic expectations about uh, future income related to seeing the rich around you, that this income inequality um, creates false expectations in your own uh, income projection, either in that indicator or also in the expected percentage change in household income. OK. So then the, the next story, we can a similar um, idea, just uh, but the similar structure from the PSID of looking at precautionary savings, and we look at whether the variance, we find um, an effect between the standard deviation of your, your future income, looking forward, and the, the uh, income of the rich, and we find no effect there. The effect, well, we find some effect that goes the wrong way with that story. All right, so now we, we've, we've, in our minds at least, eliminated these stories where that, that there's a permanent income or a precautionary savings effect that's driving these correlation associations that we first documented. And instead, now we go after home equity channels um, that, that maybe there's a, um, a wealth effect, so along the lines of what we were talking before, that top income growth may drive house prices up, which pr presumably it does, and provide more home equity borrowing along in the lines of what, what we just saw. Um, and could this be drawing, driving our main effect? Okay, these things surely are happening, but is it driving those correlations between consumption of the rich and consumption of the non-rich? So I'm just gonna show you one slice, but in the paper we do uh, three different things. Um, I'm gonna show you the, that our effect, we can do the split between homeowners and renters. So presumably this effect should not work for renters. Um, and we also could do the pre and post period in 1995 when we start to have the housing effects and the housing supply elasticities. And basically what we show with two different measures of, using two different measures of house um, consumption, that we find that renters also have a correlation between consumption uh, of the, or income, I think I'm showing you, income of the rich and consumption of the non-rich for renters as well. So this story is not explaining what, what we've thus documented. So the other price level, price level story is the rich may be getting richer and that drives up local prices. It's related to the, the, the wealth channel but not exactly the same thing. Um, and so if individuals have habits of consumption or if households have consumption commitments, um, then these price levels could cause more consumption uh, by the non-rich just by not, not even any change in behavior necessarily. And so so to look at this, we get local CPIs. There's a limit to what we can do in terms of the local CPIs in the, in the panel. We also have done product level local CPIs, but the time series is not very good. Um, and, and we can see in, in this, this first half here that actually the rich income does, does strongly um, explain, or carries a lot of the R squared explaining the local price CPI, which is which is interesting, that's, that's the, first, the first two, uh, the two pieces here at the top. But what we see then when we control for this effect 
on our main estimation strategy that there, there is, um, the local CPI does not, does not alter our coefficients on um, our main effect between consumption um, of the, the non-rich and consumption of the rich or income of the rich. Okay, so having eliminated all of that, which was already a few data sets and a bit of work, we're, 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 we're kind of left with um, two stories that are what we would call non-traditional. Um, so we've eliminated the, these um, kind of just uh, regular economic, uh, whether it's price or permanent income stories that would, would come out of models. And we think now about more, uh, if you want to sense behavioral, but this one need not be behavioral. Uh, the, the idea of maybe what we're identifying here is a redefining of what Jones's is. So visibility, and you think about the, the rich consuming, maybe Jones's is, is, is not about, keeping up with the Joneses is not about your neighbor, but it's about some status-seeking um, uh, model that you use. Uh, interestingly, by the way, our effect is really not the top 1%. It's somewhere between these 80 and, um, and 99. If you look at the, the 1% and the buying of the yachts, we don't see this type of behavior. So maybe it's some sort of Jones's effect, status seeking, or alternatively, there's some work um, Jesse Hanbury and some others are talking about how uh, the uh, areas where you have more, more the richer getting richer, there's a product catering and a, a establishment catering to those rich, and so maybe we have supply driven demand. Okay, so to go after these stories, we set up a demand system so we can look at the individual products of the CEX, whether you know, the, uh, the spending on utilities versus the spending on salons and fitness centers things. And so we, we look at then, we set up the demand system to look at these individual items loading again just on the income of the rich, okay? And so I'm not gonna, this is obviously too small. This is us sh just showing you that we estimate all these. For the ones that are significant, I wanna draw attention to a couple of things. So um, now here is our, these are income elasticities to gauge whether the, the goods that we're loading on are, are more rich goods or more necessity type goods. Versus, and here's the visibility index. And what we see over here is, is the, the coefficient loading on income of the rich. We see that the non-rich um, for food away from home, salons, domestic services, these are the things where there's that association is strong where utilities and gas and transit, you, you see a negative relationship, which sort of makes sense with our intuition of what you're spending out of. However, it doesn't fully distinguish if I take those coefficients and I, ah, come on, come on, come on. If I take those coefficients, page down, page up, and I just run a regression of the tw 29 categories on the last of those betas that I have estimated. So let me, let me go back and say it better. Um, if, if I take these coefficients, which is loading the beta on log of the rich income, and I, I, I then turn around and just do a kind of a very, very simplistic estimation with the 29 observations and see how they load on elasticity and visibility, um, I find it loads on both. Um, which doesn't help us disentangle the story fully of whether what we're finding is uh, a trickle-down consumption in terms of redefining of the Joneses, or it's about a, the supply-driven demand, about the, 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 the suppliers of goods catering to the rich. But at this point, however, we've eliminated uh, most of, almost any explanation that we can come up with other than some sort of relationship on these two, and so then we start in the paper to use a more causal language on that correlation that we start out with. Okay, so we do a couple of other things that just to, to get to this mechanism a little bit, because um, as we've spoken a lot here, uh, the, the role of credit in this mechanism to see this extra, extra consumption, if you will, in the language we were speaking before. Um, so what we do is, uh, three things. One, we look at, at self-reported, um, back in the survey of consumers, we look at self-reports of are you worse financially, uh, are you worse off financially? 
um, and relate that to income of the rich? Uh, are there more bankruptcy filings in state years? Relate that to the, the income of the rich. And then the, the voting on the consumer, consumer bills um, related to uh, consumer finance bills, I should say. OK, so just quickly, we find that people that are in areas where that have higher, again, the same structure, controlling for state and year fixed effects and own income, people will say they're worse off financially than a year ago if they're in areas with, with a higher income of the rich. Um, similarly, people have, will say they have more expenses and more debt than a year, than a year ago if they are in locations with higher income of the rich. Um, personal bankruptcies, this is uh, personal bankruptcy not just of the non-rich but everyone, so this is really kind of an amazing test. It's kind of really was surprising. We, were, we've, uh, we expected there to be effect. We didn't expect to be able to identify it. Um, but we find that, that if you look at T minus 2, because it takes some time for personal bankruptcy, if you look at the, the lag version of income of the rich, the income of the rich predicts per personal bankruptcies in the future. And we show a bunch of different um, d points in the distribution. We did a bunch of different tests to see if this is robust. And then we're not picking up something else. Um, but it, 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 it stays really um, robust across adding in other points in the distribution. Finally, we look at the, uh, the Fannie and, and Freddie um, bill that opened up the credit. And we looked at, yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's the, that's a, yeah, no, it's, it's for the, it's state, state numbers. Yeah, so it's, um, yes, I can't, yes. So then we look at the, 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 the uh, bill that, that uh, sent Fetty and, and Fannie out to, to, to offer more credit. Um, we mapped the con Congress districts, the House districts, onto, um, census tracts to get inequality measures for that, that data. And, and we looked at then the relationship between income inequality in the districts and the voting among the, the Republicans, the Democrats voted pretty much all one way. And um, we again see um, a significant relationship. You know, it gets weaker. Uh, those, that one asterisk generally means 5% in our tests. So, so um, we find that relationship as well. Finally, to, to end with, we want to speak to the magnitude of what we found. Um, if we take what we, what we take our estimates of what we had at the very beginning that I showed you, and what we do is a counterfactual exercise where we go back in time to 1980 and, say, and we say, what we, we we take the income of the rich and say, what would the income of the rich have looked like had it grown at the the, the the growth rate of income of the median. Okay, so the median in, in, we impose that lower growth rate on the income of the rich back from 1980, and then use the consumption estimates that we have thus far to project what consumption of the non-rich would have been had income of the rich not grown as, as drastically as it did. And here's um, the estimate from that using, this is using the IV. Um, what we see, uh, in 2005 is probably a better, a better estimate. So here, these are the, the interesting columns are perhaps the column two, which is in dollars. What column two in dollars says is, is take 2005, that the non-rich households would be spending 1,700 less had the income of the rich not grown um, as drastically as it was. My prior estimates were smaller than this, and Chris Carroll jumped all over and said, how can that add up? Because that's a big number. There's a lot of these households. So what we did is we took the aggregate data. We multiplied that times the number of households. And here we have the, the savings rates, which I probably have to adjust. Uh, we, we have the savings rates um, that are given in NIPA, and then we, we calculate then in aggregate using the dollars what the savings rate under our counterfactual would be and, the, and you see the, the savings rate or our personal savings rate under our counterfactual would, would be a higher rate by about 2%, which is large. Um, 
but that is kind of the, the punchline of the paper is that we think that there is a causal relationship between um, as best as we can. I'm going to say that causal as best as we can. We've gone after every possible story that we can come up with. We do, in terms of the, the mechanism, whether it's the status-seeking trickle-down consumption or the supply-driven effect, we're not able to disentangle. But nevertheless, we do think there's a causal consumption to consumption, and it, it, it implies 1,800 per household uh, by the end of the period, which is 2% less. Um, in the counterfactual. So I'll just leave it there because I'm out of time. Um, I think, so, so the only issue that's troubling me is just the dynamics of all of it. I mean, there's some budget constraint out there for these guys, and we know income's not changing, and so, I'm happy to believe the story, but at some point you've got to see it reverse sharply, right? I mean, at some point, if these guys are consuming way more than their income allows them to because they're mimicking the top guys, um, right? I, so the bankruptcy results are headed in that direction, but we should also see at some point their, con I mean, we should see their consumption collapse at some point. Uh, this is kind of a Ponzi scheme otherwise, right? It can't last forever. Um, so I, I would think, I mean, the, the two pieces, right? So the saving less and borrowing more. And so your collapse is to the extent, um, you know, we, we do see the baby boomers getting into retirement with no savings. So just an overall, you know, shift in, in, in that, you know, these are working individuals. Um, and in terms of then what, what is household debt over time and how that collapses and, and the implications. No, yeah, I, we haven't gone down that path, but I, I mean, thoughts on on how to to aggregate that would be welcome. Um, that I think it probably lines up with the recession, right? So I, the idea I have is you just have a cross section of states based on the top income share. Just look at the consumption patterns of the low guys. You'll see them boom, exactly your channel. But yeah. it's, I would think maybe during the recession or afterwards they. they yeah, the thing collapse. is, though, we we see this pattern back to 1980. I can subsample it, and I still find these the same kind of magnitude of coefficients going. Oh, yeah, oh, I think it's a long boom. I think it's a very long boom in 1980 to 2008, but it ends, right? I mean, that's kind of the secular increase in household debt. I mean, I, I think, it, 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 yeah, I mean, the, the problem with the identification strategy of saying income's no different is that, well, by definition, then consumption can't consistently be right. higher forever. And so I think it might strengthen the story. I don't know how, when the data availability go through. Maybe 2008's the last year of the data, but... Sure. My, my point is somewhat um, similar, that uh, I think your, your paper is sort of about, um, in some sense, the, the demand side. People want to spend more. Um, but um, as uh, Amher points out, um, you know, the, the kinds of people, especially sort of people in the bottom half, let's say, of the distribution. You look at those people in the survey of consumer finances and they basically have zero wealth uh, on net every single time they get surveyed. And so they're basically spending their income uh, uh, over, you know, you know, several year periods anyway. Um, so the, the only way they might be able to satisfy their um, desire to emulate the spending of richer people is if there is an expansion in the availability of credit, right? So the question then is whether um, the undoubted expansion in the availability of credit that occurred during this financial liberalization period um, overlapped perfectly with the set of people that you are identifying. That is, we know that the expansion of credit availability uh, was was greatest for, you know, not the people at the top who could already borrow if they wanted to, but they didn't want to borrow. Um, so we're back again to this difficulty of distinguishing um, supply of credit for demand for credit, because it had to be credit one way or the other that, that financed the extra spending. Um, I don't know that there's uh, a good way to get, ar get around that. But I do think that the, the, I the really interesting counterfactual is, um, you know, what if we hadn't had 
the long boom in the availability of credit. Um, may, it might have been that we would have had an increase in income inequality, and it might have been we would have had an increase in unhappiness um, caused by that, but um, it's not clear there would have been any effect on um, actual consumption and saving. Great, thanks. I don't, you don't think the CEX data on, on debt is sufficient to run that counterfactual, do you? That's, what, that's why we didn't do go that way, but. OK. <laughs> uh, one question is, the, if you look at the cross uh, industries, uh, the, the type of consumption increases is like eating out or saloon or more like a differentiated goods while the one which decline is gasoline and uh, homogeneous goods. So it may be like, a, like a, with rich people coming into the region, the variety of differentiated goods, like a restaurant and uh, high quality service may increase. So, so effect might be through the variety uh, yes. su supply effect. You did control that, that sort of thing? So, um, so that was what we were going after with that supply driven demand test. So this is the the work of this uh, Jesse Henberry that I mentioned that talking about how um, the, the, the types of restaurants respond to inequality. And so whether that supply, which I think is totally interesting, we don't have the data to go after the geography that specifically, but I, I mean, it's, it's definitely a channel we think is, is um, working and I think there's a lot of new research going that way. It's terribly interesting. So. So uh, you control for a household's own income in your analysis, which makes sense, but uh, I was wondering whether you've thought about whether ho household income is endogenous to the incomes and the consumption of the rich. So what I have in mind is your theory is basically that the marginal utility of consumption for the lower income guys is going up when the consumption of the rich is rising, right? And you would think in a standard model that that would make the lower income people want to work more and earn more, so their own income you know, one way you can balance the budget, coming back to the earlier questions, is to try to earn more yourself. So I was wondering if you've directly looked at the impact on yeah, lower so that, income. I think we, we do okay with, that was the PSID test, looking at your future income. Con, so you're in Alabama in 1980, and what's your future income related to how, how the, whether the rich are getting richer essentially in your, in your state. So, and we and find no, no relationship between your future income and the income of the rich in your state year. But so wouldn't you expect to find a relationship because your marginal utility of consumption is higher? Right, uh, I mean, I, I value consumption more. One thing I can do to try to get more consumption yeah, is yeah, to Yeah, no, raise I see what income. you're saying. The, right. For the model we have in mind that we pitch at the end, it has a feedback then to that, that yeah. relationship, but we actually, but there's, there is no correlation in those, those, those metrics, so I, your, so question, your question's deeper than the, 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 the first pass we did here. I will think about it. But in case there is no relationship in that, so which suggests then it's not about a, a valuing. It may be about your consumption commitments going up or things that are related to um, the supply-driven um, effect. But it's a, it's a thoughtful question. I'll think about it. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> These are amazing results. When I looked at this last slide and everything that preceded it, I understand this as being entirely identified off of the local state level variation. Yes. But presumably the channels that you're identifying work not only locally, but work nationally and internationally. When I think about the fancy kitchens that I see in the world, you know, four of them are in Cambridge and the other hundred that I see are in you know, the New York Times Magazine advertisements for condominiums in New York City. Um, so I would think that most of the channels for the kinds of effects that we're describing, that you're describing, aren't local, which means that whatever you're showing us here is just a drop in the, well, maybe a big drop in the, in the bucket. Have you thought about how this kind of yes. adds up? Yes, so uh, thanks. The, the, I mean, uh, the national effects, so we started to go down the advertising Nielsen data um, as our 12th data set to look at. And um, actually, we, we, bit, we benchmarked this, this table to, to Mark's work on 
how big the, you know, the difference between consumption and income inequality, and we come out somewhat in the range just with this local effect of what Mark is finding. But um, it matters then whether it's this trickle-down notion of status-seeking versus the supply stuff, right? And so if we could, you know, more, it, it was getting too much, and so we stopped. But the next step would be really to try to dig into those things, and I, I yeah, take your comment. Thanks. That's nice. Is there any possibility that you're looking at intergenerational transfers? That when parents do well or less well, they give less money to separate households who are younger? But um, I'm, I'm pausing for a second to think through all that. That would have to be something about the income of the, the rich a few years, a number of years ago. I mean, I'm controlling for state and year, so. I'm talking about gifts, not inheritance. No, no, I understand, but it had to be that the rich are getting richer in your state that was your parent a number of years ago, and that, that money then transferred to you because of the, say, say the, say there's a financial wealth or something in your state year that increased the, the, the ability to consume. It's just hard to think through with all the state and the business cycle fixed effect how that we could identify that particularly hard to, well, it would be hard to identify and test but I'm wondering if it's what's going on since a lot of people do live in the same so area where their parents do and if the parents are uh, if when they're doing well sharing that with their children and when they're not doing well they the, put the, that into reverse then you don't measure that directly as the as the younger generation's income but it would affect their consumption I Yeah, it includes it includes all. So I could just do a labor labor story, as well. I mean, I could just look at labor income to address it. The other thing is, I, I believe Jonathan Parker et al. have work on the rise. You know, this new income. I'm not the expert here. They're experts here. But the the rise in the income inequality is due to actually income and in, off of labor. Um, there's a lot more of labor income contributing to the income inequality than financial income than we've seen in the past, which doesn't go down this path. But it's, worth, it's certainly worth thinking about, but I could easily run the thing with labor income with it rather than, than total. Thank you. Um, so the rich are not credit constrained. Easing of standards should not affect their consumption. But we also know that uh, easing of credit is also associated with, you know, asset price affects asset price growth and hence capital gains. So while credit growth may affect the consumption of the low-income people directly because they are constrained, to the rich, the effect may be through the asset price markets and capital gains. So there may still be the credit factor driving both income growth instead of trickle down between the two, just a Okay, so again, suggesting I should, I should also show you labor income. If I show you just this, this relationship, instrument and consumption of the rich with labor income of the non-rich, it helps me on both of these things. So super comment. Yeah, I'll do it. I just wanted to ask very quickly in terms of a clarification, when you look at the personal savings rate and the increase, the assumption would be that 100% of that is incurring in the lower income households correct, where the net savings rate currently is effectively zero. So this is an, an almost infinite increase in the rates of savings for that segment of the population. That, that's correct. Again, my exercise, this is along the line. Chris is laughing in front of you because this is what he was hounding me on. The, the, the exercise here was we just took the dollars for and the number of households below 80 in the United States, and we multiplied it up took the dollars in the total savings rate implied from national income, and then went back to ratios. So, so if we were to extend that then, is there an implication from a social safety net component when we look at, a social, at, at effective savings through Social Security or Medicare that is not being captured in terms of an income effect? That's hard, it's hard for me to answer. I'm, we, um, yeah, I, I, perhaps. I mean, I, I think we're, you know, when we get to these aggregate numbers, 
um, and the whole budget constraint and thinking about that and then going back to the individual and understanding the $1,800. Um, there are certainly individuals where that, that figure doesn't work in their budget constraint. And so I think we're doing more in the distribution and understanding what that means for different people and how the safety net and how different budget constraints filter in and, after, and then going after what Amar was saying as well in terms of understanding then the total adding up that, that whether the where credit is facilitating. I think that's something that, that we should push more on to actually make these numbers um, palatable. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.